And our next guest, I can guarantee, has not left a game early that he's worked on. Maybe as a fan at some point, Andrew Monaco, the voice of the Aggies here. How are you, sir? I'm great. How are you? I'm great, man. I'm so excited to uh, get to talk to you because I followed your career even before you got here to A&M. Is this season number four? Season number four. Goodness, man. Time flies. Somehow I got an extension. I don't know. They had every chance to get rid of me in the first three, but... (laughs) How did the uh, how's the transition gone now that because I'm going through a similar transition yeah. following a, a, a I'm not gonna call Gabe a legend but he <laughs> he's kind of a legend in his own mind I love Gabe no but following a guy who did it so well for so uh-huh. long and at a high high level how was that for you intimidating fun no if if uh, if Dave were not so welcoming and hey what do you need to know I think it would have been a lot more difficult. But that wasn't the case at all. And the other welcoming thing is Aggie fans were absolutely welcoming. So that made it an an awful lot easier. So that was just the wonderful part of it. I I always joke, 33 years, if a job only opens every 33 years, you got to go take it. And when you're following someone like Dave South, class, you know, the epitome, icon, I know we throw that word around. He is absolutely an icon. He's the soundtrack of at least a couple generations of Aggie fans, but for him being so welcoming and and it was really n- not getting in the way, anything like that can always go to advice and that he's a friend made it a, a ton easier. That's for sure. And uh, coming in with Jimbo here, has got, I mean, like, like people are giving me a hard time, like, oh, now you get to come back to College Station. You join right when, you know, Jimbo's getting started and things are going great. How, how, how has that been? You know, the first show we did, his first coach's show, he came in to Rudy's and um, large applause. So I had to test and see, okay, let's, I hope he has a sense of humor. And I turned to him as the show opened. I said, I thought all that was for me. So he did <laughs> laugh. Uh, it's been fantastic. And the relationship has been fantastic. Not just the every week on that show where you learn an awful lot and, and just, a, oh God, just the information that you get from a, from a Jimbo Fisher but being able to go in the spring to all the coaches' nights that we were able to do around the state this past May and just being around him. Um, I've, I'm spoiled with Jimbo Fisher, Buzz Williams, and now Jim Schlossnagel. That's an unbelievable trio right there. It is. I, I said at our kickoff a couple weeks back that I, I think we're entering the glory years of AM athletics in, in general. I mean, we know what Gary Blair's been able to do with the women's program, what G's doing there with soccer, uh, obviously – uh, Pat Henry with, mm-hmm. with track and field and whatnot. Jimbo, to me, legendary status. Sloss. Buzz, I think, is turning it around. This is just a really good time in Aggie athletics. And I like all three people, yeah. not just the coaches, the people. I, I So many times during Jimbo's show and Buzz's show, they become life lessons as opposed to just the sports lessons. I just think when you have coaches like that, it is to put – You trust your son or your daughter with those coaches, and you have to, as a parent, you would have to be so pleased to know that. And after four years, all those lessons, everything that you've learned, what they learn about themselves because of those coaches, it's why I always say, anytime around Aggie student-athletes, our future, we're in really good hands because they are just quality, quality young men and women, that's for sure. How was it working with Pop? You know what? We did not have to interview Pop at the end of the third quarter, so we were great. <laughs> okay, makes a, makes a difference. He, like he's one that I, I I am okay with his attitude, if you will, with some people because he's a winner and he's great and he's very funny, in my opinion. There's others that I've dealt with, maybe the former Texans head coach, that were a little rough with the media that didn't win. So, or at, at that kind of level, at least. So it, it's nice knowing people around. Everybody who's been around Pop says he's great. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just. Uh, Uh, one of the smartest people I know. It's more than just basketball. Now, I guess if you've been there 23, 24 years, it's easy. It wasn't like that before they won their first championship. It was, you know, it was more difficult, but he's earned that, but he's the same way with his players. It's more than just NBA basketball. Yes, that's important. And you're going to do that, but he's going to open up a world to them. If you're, if you're going to be in Washington, DC, you know what? There's a field trip, so to speak. We're going to go to the Holocaust museum, or we're going to go to a civil rights museum, or we're, there's more. What can we expose all these athletes to? Yes, I know they're adults, but what can we do? That's one of the many things. And you talk about culture. You either live it or you just say it. And that's part of it. The Spurs had that culture. And they, that's what they stand by. You want to be a part of that? That's what it is. And, and he's one of the big reasons for that. 
Andrew Monaco with us here in studio, and uh, we're getting a lot of text messages on the AMB text line. I'm going to read you this one from Sandy. My day is made with Andrew oh. on the show. Love your insight and your delivery and your interaction with the passionate Aggies. Keep doing what you're doing all the way to the championship game this year. And I really, look, I don't know if we're going to win a national championship. I don't know if we're going to make the college football playoffs, but it feels like we're going to do it, if not this year, next year. So, like, there's a feeling around the program that I haven't felt in a very long time, and it's, it feels like sustainable success as well. I agree. It's a, it's a quiet confidence. They had all come through 12th Man Productions for, we call it the car wash, three days of Ask the Aggies what's going to be on the boards at, at Kyle Field, and you could just get a chance to talk with them. We did some stuff for The Pulse. We're going to do some stuff for our radio shows. There is that quiet confidence. The, the right leaders came back for that fifth season. I think that's important. Some schools have chuckleheads coming back for that fifth, and coaches have to find a way to get rid of them. But I think they're going to be the leaders. And then when you talk to the incoming players, it's that same attitude. They can't wait to be here, not for themselves, but for this program. And I think that is what's uh, throughout this entire program is that confidence. The guys coming back know what it takes to go 9-1. and one. That's the Monday through Friday part of it, and then do it on Saturday. And now they are going to teach the incoming players – this is the way we do it. I brought up the word culture. That's what's here. That's what Jimbo has instilled, or as he would say, that's what the players have instilled. Players recruit players. You bring in the right ones who it's about Texas A&M and not about themselves. That was that quiet confidence that I, that I really noticed as, as they came through and we got a chance to talk with them. You mentioned quiet confidence. I'm watching at practice last week. The way they walk, Correct. there's like a, they just know like we're here. The, the way they communicate with each other, the way they take the sets before practice. I'm watching Michael Clemens work and just before practice, how hard he's going. Uh, there's a, I tell my kids all the time, there's a price to pay to be great. <laughs> and they're doing it. They're putting in the work. They're putting in the attitude and the focus. But not just the motions, right? Right, correct. It's, it's a big difference. Now, if you are a D lineman and you see Michael Clemens doing that, how can you take a play off? You can't because you're going to have to answer to Michael or you're going to have to answer to Marv. That, when you have to answer to a teammate, same thing when that, in that secondary. It's, it's the same thing. I, the one thing I love to do at practice, I like to see who's first in a drill because that person can't mess up, right? But if they do, they take the heat, not their teammates. Right. So to me, it's I'm always interested who's first in a drill. Are they going to do it the right way? And more times than not, you're going to see the experienced player do it because he's going to set the tone for the rest of that drill. And you talked about just walking and getting work done. There's no downtime. They know that we have these two hours to practice. We're going to get all this work. And I asked Jimbo one time, he kept talking about tempo, tempo, tempo. And I thought it was about Saturday's opponent. He said, no, we only have so many hours to practice. I want to get as many plays, let them perfect their craft as many times as possible. You're seeing that now with this group. All right, so this is their preseason, their their fall camp, getting ready. How do you get ready for a season? What goes into what you're doing here in, in, in August? Uh, it's a little easier now because uh, not as many numbers have changed, but mm-hmm. names to numbers and to see who is where. So come Saturday, you know who's going to be. You know, we get the two deeps. But what's a little deeper than uh, to see who's on the special teams, to see, oh, so-and-so's practicing here. So when it when it happens – you kind of know that just getting familiar with that. And then some of the backstories that's nice about getting the one-on-one time with the players to get those, those backstories that we can tell on the air, talk with Dave, talk with Will about that becomes a point, especially if if so-and-so makes a play or it comes to a time we've got some time to fill it. Anytime you can tell stories about these student athletes, it's, it's wonderful. So we do this series called 21 and 21 presented by Factory Builder Stores, and we're kind of going through the top 21 players on the, on the A&M roster. And today we're at number 12, Caleb Chapman. How big can he be for this offense this year? Stretch that to defense, right? You can't, no longer can that defense play so close to the line and try to stop the run or the short passes. Now if you can go deep, it kind of loosens them up. And the moment you loosen that up, it kind of opens up everything else. Just so many weapons. This team is deeper than I think it's been under Jimbo Fisher, but it's also more talented. And there's going to be a lot more names that you're going to see because there is that talent. But someone like Caleb, you saw against Florida, get deep. It kind of opens up everything else. That, that passing game, for him to go deep, now you're not playing as close to the line. 
does that open it up for the Isaiah Spillers right. and for the Devon H? And, and to me, to be able to give Jimbo all those pieces to the puzzle, who he's, you know he's going to make it fit. And then you're like, okay, oh, oh, and there's Anaya Smith. Correct. And oh, there's Demon Demas, who Correct. I think is going to have a big year. There's mm-hmm. so many different weapons. And then what you can do for mismatches with when you put Anias in the back or you move them, split them out, I mean, it confuses the defense. And the, depending on the personnel they have out there, it's, they don't have the, the, the infrastructure to stop it. That's the whole thing. Now it becomes mismatches. And you have to find, in any sport, right, you want to find the mismatch. The beauty of watching a Jimbo Fisher coach team is, when I have the mismatch, we don't go to it once and then say, okay, we did that. Let's do something else. Nope, you keep doing it until that defense stops it. And if they don't, you keep doing it again. But that's the. I think there's a ton of versatility on this offense. I think you add, not that Kellen couldn't run because he could, and we saw that effectiveness, did, yeah. but Haynes can do it. And as Jimbo Fisher was saying about both his coaches, we know Haynes is athletic, but he can throw the ball. We know that Zach can throw the ball, but he's more athletic. He's always going to have a complete player, whether it's under center, whether it's on the outside, they're going to be complete. The other thing I think fans have to understand is Jimbo's not going to put somebody out there on a Saturday and hope he gets the play down. That's the Monday through Friday. And that's what you see in a lot of this fall camp is not just technique, but that can you perfect this play? That's what's going on out there. And to your point, when you see that Michael Clemens still working on his technique, when you see any player wanting to get better. I think that goes throughout the entire program. And I think that's something you can see in any organization. When you have the top dog who's modeling the behavior that you're supposed to do, you have to follow suit or you don't fit in. Right. I agree with that. And I know we're going to have a new quarterback, but both Haynes King and Zach Calzada saw how Kellen was coached by Jimbo Fisher. That's going to be very important because now it's on them. I think the one thing I really liked that Haynes said to us a couple of weeks ago, uh, he asked, you know, the quarterback competition. He says, I'm not competing against Zach. I'm competing against Coach Elko's defense. How valuable is that, especially in the fall? All those looks, all that talent, you hear so much of iron sharpens iron. But whether it's that offensive line going up against the defensive line or the other way around or the receivers and those DBs, you can't help but get better every single day. I'm not saying Saturday is easy, (laughs) but it should make Saturdays a lot easier because you've already passed that test every single day of the week. Can you stick around for one more segment? Certainly will. All right, because I want to talk to you about the quarterbacks. I want to talk to you about the offensive line because those are questions that we have. And also maybe give you a little time to think about a game that you may have left early that you shouldn't have, but you've been in the business so long. (laughs) I I know like since I've been in the business, I have not left the game early. But let's uh, talk a little bit about the quarterback situation. I was... Reading an article today in College Football News, and it reminded me, nine of the top 13 teams in the country have a new starting quarterback. Yeah. Yet whenever they talk about A&M, that is mm-hmm. one of the first things they talk about. Mm-hmm. And the two guys that are vying for that position have a lot of game. Yeah. And, and in fact, Haynes has won a state championship. Your thoughts <laughs> heading into this season, having some winners back there? My thought, I'm going to ask you a question to answer your question. How come it's never affecting Alabama like it affects Texas A&M? That having a new quarterback, sure. but they still have as high a rating. So I think the only reason is, is because Nick Saban is on a different level and they feel that he can manipulate Correct. the situation to work. That being said, I think Jimbo is on that same tier or step below. Obviously, nobody's at Nick Saban's label, but Jimbo's that next guy knocking on that door. I agree with that. See, that's, I, Alabama has proven they have done it. Now it's time for Texas A&M to prove that the Aggies belong on that level, knocking on the door for the CFP or being just outside. And again, you mentioned something that I think goes into evaluation, a reason why certain guys succeed. Haynes King, a winner. Zach Calzana, Zach Zach Calzada, a winner. When you have winning in your past, it becomes part of your DNA. And once again, you know what it takes. You have got to know if you're going to play for Jimbo Fisher. You better know the playbook. You better be able to speak his language. You better be able to take it to another level. Because you, for all the practices this month, where he's going to be behind you on that field, he's no longer behind you on a Saturday. So you guys have to be able to see the same things. And I think they both possess that. If they didn't, it wouldn't be a competition. The other thing he says, and I'm going to go back to three years of Kellen Mond and Nick Starkle when the job was up for grabs. He always said, the team will pick your quarterback. 
So some, some of it is out of his hands. The team will pick. But if you talk to any of those players on the team, they love both those guys. And they, they, they love who they have brought in. But you have to know there is a certain standard. Jimbo is going to be hard on his quarterbacks. Guess what? Jimbo is going to be hard on his wide receivers. He's always said receivers should be quarterbacks. Quarterbacks should be receivers. Sure. So they can get into each other's minds and know exactly what they're going through. But I think your point about winning in the past, oh, that means a lot. Same thing as, as a coach's son. You know what it takes. And John King, just all, that's all he did was win there in, right. long, in Longview. So you mentioned the wide receivers and quarterbacks flip-flopping. You look at some of the best CEOs in the world. They have done every position of their company. Correct. They've built it. And I think there's something to be said about understanding the entire offense. David, I have a friend who uh, he owns a mortgage company, will not hire anybody who hasn't been in team sports because it's along those lines. Not just that team player, but you're right. The successful ones don't just they don't just st- stay up on that on that cliff and look down and demand that this. Ha- you're right. They have been there in each of those roles, and you understand when someone comes to you with a problem. How can we solve this? I've I've been in your shoes, and that's to me it's 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 important. It's you have to you have to have that understanding, and that's why you know in practice can you. Look and see what happens during the downtime. If you have 95 players all on their own, bad sign. But when you have groups of players, and it doesn't even have to be in the same position, sure. when you see them together for those five minutes, enjoying, and then going back and competing, now you know you have something special. I'm going to use my career as an example, and I'm sure you went through something similar. I think I'm a better reporter slash commentator because I've done every role in the media from shooting my own stuff, editing my own stuff, carrying equipment, uh, learning uh, the behind the scenes things to whenever you have to report. People out of college going to a top 10 market job usually don't have, they, they may have the face and the voice. They may not have the other resources to them. Uh, believe me, if you are going to be a jerk to your crew, they're going to hang you out to dry. Sure. They, could, they could care less. You know, we were talking about coming here to this job. How fortunate is it? I, I had the confidence in myself, but how much better is it that I get to stand beside Dave Elmendorf every Saturday, mm-hmm. that I get to do basketball with Dr. John Thornton, that I've got Scott Clendenin, Will Johnson, John Sheshik in the baseball booth. That's what you don't know coming in. And now it just becomes even better when, when you get to be partnered with, with people like that. Again, just two or three guys watching a game is really all it is. But understanding that my producer back at Learfield, we've got to be on that same page. And I've been that board op who's worked games on holidays. Sure. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? When there's no one else in the, in the station. You understand what they're going through. So if there is a mistake, I, what, I'm going to come down? On him or her, I, I can't do that. I've been there. I'm the one who hasn't pressed the button You're quickly exactly enough. Exactly right. Yeah. We, we've all been there. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the offensive line. Another question mark there because of the four new starters. Uh, but I believe the talent there, if they reach mm-hmm. that level, and the chemistry is a big part of it, correct, could be as good or better. Yeah, I, I agree. Because you have a, a Kenyon Green and All-American, right? You have a Lane Robinson who took snaps in the SEC, was absolutely dominant in the, in the South Carolina right. win there in Columbia. You've got Luke Matthews, who has taken SEC snaps. You've got Jameer Johnson, who comes from Tennessee, who was there in the fire. Not only the grad and that experience bringing in, but he's got SEC experience, so you have that. And we have to remember the Maroon Goons last year needed a little bit of time to mesh as well. That's going to come, and that comes with the reps Jimbo Fisher has moved them around, not just in the spring. He'll probably do that in the fall. Once again, understanding, okay, if uh, the guy next to me is going through this, you have that understanding as well. I think that happens on the offensive line. Also, your tight ends. This is why I love Jalen Widemeyer. Wants to be the complete tight end. That includes the blocking part of it. So that becomes your sixth offensive lineman. And it's the same thing with you, you love Anaya Smith for every catch and every juke and when he can jam that foot in the dirt and, and leave somebody frozen. But he's also going to be there in pass protection mm-hmm. and protecting his quarterback. It all has to be in concert. But I'm with you. It's going to take a little bit of time. But don't think that time for them is, oh, we've got to be ready for October 9th just because it's Alabama. They'll be ready September 4th, but that doesn't mean they can't keep getting better because the more snaps together, the more that we're going to be really, really good, I think. Running out of time, I, I we didn't really focus as much on the defense, but let's talk about it. Nine returning starters, I mean, just 
Adonis. I mean, you got huge guys, six yeah. year star. I mean, you've got the super seniors. You've got Marv, who's going to be probably a top five pick. Yeah. What a loaded D. Yeah. And I think that's, you get lost because we as fans look at offenses when we talk about teams, right? I like that, that number nine coming back. And I think it's the right nine coming back to set that tone. I think that D line, Jimbo says, guys with the hands in the dirt. That D-line is going to disrupt an awful lot of offensive lines on Saturdays. I love the depth at linebacker as well. They can go get it. And on that back end, Dave Elmendorf, my partner, the former safety, right, with here and with the Rams, always said that front four can set up the back seven. And sometimes that coverage will allow those sacks for that front four. I like that they're working in concert. And if we talk about Jimbo's offense, let's talk about now four years under Coach Mike Elko on defense. Thank you so much for coming in. Pleasure, my friend. We're going to do it more often, right? Absolutely. All right, Andrew Monaco, thank you so much.